Hi, I'm Dr. JJ Wicker. And I'm Dr. Lindsay Tuba. And today in our Coffee Talk, we're going to be discussing auditory deprivation and what it can do to the auditory processing centers in the brain. So... Yep, absolutely. And before we get going with this Coffee Talk, please be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that notification bell so that as we come out with new content, you can share with your friends and family. So auditory deprivation, first, I think we should describe what it is. Um, and I think it can be implied to most people, but deprivation just means um, lack of access to sound when we're talking about auditory deprivation. And of course, auditory deprivation is important when we're talking about children who want to learn to communicate using listening and spoken language, because when they don't have access to sounds, then of course they can't hear the sounds that they need to hear to develop that spoken language. But even deeper than that, when we're talking about deprivation, there are a lot of implications for uh, those central processing mechanisms that are crucial in our ability to understand not just what we're hearing, but how to use what we're hearing to communicate. Sure. And I think it's also important to note that if you're a parent who has a child who has chosen a um, visual form of communication, that there can also be deprivation there if they're not getting um, a language rich environment with that visual communication. And we can do another video on that later. But today, specifically, we're going to be talking about auditory deprivation for those who um, have chosen hearing and spoken language as their goal. Yes, absolutely. So when can auditory deprivation happen? I think it can happen in multiple ways. The most obvious one is when there's hearing loss and we're not doing anything about it, mm -hmm. right? And that can happen a lot with children who have uh, mild hearing losses. And we did yeah. do a video about that on the importance of <clears throat> being more aggressive than histor historically people have been when it comes to children who have mild hearing losses and people are kind of dismissive about that and say, well, they're still responding to loud noises. So let them be, but um, not giving them those access to sounds can uh, really change their future in terms of memory development, cognitive development. Um, and I would be willing to bet my money that those children are going to be at risk for early onset um, uh, Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. uh, or... Well, that's what the research tends to, to, to show. show. For sure. And I think it's also important to understand that when we're talking about deprivation, it isn't an all or none thing. So like Dr. Wicker said, um, mild hearing loss, they're still getting deprived of certain sounds. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about auditory deprivation, we're not necessarily talking about everything's cut off, um, although that could be the case. Um, but we're really referring to the spectrum of deprivation right where it can you know range from from all or nothing, <laughs> from all or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> to, to just some deprivation um but then the other piece the other ways that you can uh, have auditory deprivation is maybe you do have hearing aids um, but they're not appropriately programmed, yeah, you know, yeah, and, th sure. and that can happen a lot when, um, and especially when you're working with children, uh, there's a lot of physiology behind it, which we won't go into mostly because we're not wanting to talk about physiology, <laughs> <laughs> but um, children, because they have smaller ear canal volumes, they have different acoustics. And so a lot of times um, if you were to program hearing aids for adults who have the exact same type of hearing loss, children are going to need a lot more amplification if they're going to be learning listening and spoken language um and very different and sometimes yeah. and again that just goes to uh why it's important to go to someone who is strong in pediatrics yeah. to know these these really um, important pieces of intervention for children who are deaf or hard of hearing who want to learn to communicate using spoken language yeah great so as if you've been watching our videos you probably already know that one of my specialties is tinnitus, hyperacusis, um, and misophonia, whereas Dr. Wicker's specialty is auditory processing. So would you like to talk about first how auditory deprivation impacts auditory processing abilities? Yeah, and it kind of goes back to what I had uh, started this topic with about the implications for um, memory, cognitive declines that can happen when we are trying to access the world through hearing, but there are pieces of uh, that audition missing. Um, so when you have um, auditory deprivation that goes untreated for a long time, um, even if you are eventually fit with hearing aids or cochlear implants, a lot of times there's going to be a much higher need 
for some really strong listening therapy or oral rehabilitation because you've gone so long without hearing these sounds and suddenly being bombarded, being bombarded with these sounds can be really overwhelming. And just because you suddenly have access to these sounds doesn't mean you necessarily know how to use them. Um, and we've written a lot of blogs about that topic about why it's so important to engage in these listening therapies that go beyond just being fit with hearing aids. Um, because auditory deprivation is about the central processing of sound, not just access in general. Yeah, and there's actually even a TEDx talk out there right mm -hmm. now about auditory deprivation. Um, and somebody who became an audiologist who had auditory deprivation and developed an auditory processing disorder because right. of it. Um, so we'll put a link to that below. Um, but for my specialty, uh, hyperacusis, which is a, a sensitivity to sound, what happens a lot of times for people who have normal hearing and then have extra sensitivity to moderately loud sounds or even moderate sounds if the sensitivity is really severe, the, what comes naturally is to cover your ears with headphones um, or you know some sort of sound dampening device to block out those sounds that you just can't handle. The problem with that is it's creating an, a sound deprivation, an auditory deprivation. And what we have found with um, this is that it actually makes the sensitivity to sound worse once you take those away because the brain hasn't had that ability to process sound the sound sensitivity actually gets worse. So one of the worst things that you can do on a consistent basis is to deprive your auditory centers of your brain of sound. So it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but this has been shown um, in a lot of research that it's actually one of the worst things that you can do. Now, on rare occasions, if you're going to fireworks or something, you have a child that might be triggered, absolutely, I mean, that 30 minutes isn't going to make or break you know, right. their hyperacusis um experience however doing it continually absolutely gives you this deprivation and can make the problem worse so with really both of our specialties auditory deprivation um is not a great thing right we don't want it yeah yeah 100 percent. <laughs> and really it just again comes down to that communication piece communication is a basic human right that any uh, everyone should have access to the ability to learn to communicate um, and for most people in this world, we communicate using spoken language, and for that, we need access to sounds. And so if you um, do have a child who has these sensitivities, just plugging their ears to the world, uh, just echoing what Dr. Tuba says, it's only going to compound the issue. It might resolve the moment-to-moment -moment issues of them being triggered, but there are actually other strategies that exist to help children learn to be okay with listening in, these, in this noisy yeah. world. Yeah, because that, that, that's what this world is. Um, and we don't want to take that away and uh, impair or block their ability to learn how to use what they're hearing to to live, to communicate, to understand their environment and to thrive in it. Yeah. And there are absolutely research based therapy protocols that can help with that. So as a parent, it may be disheartening to think, oh, it's so easy to, to you know, put the headphones on my child, you know. And, and then he doesn't have a meltdown, but, but just know that there are things that can be done that can help decrease or eliminate that, that hypersensitivity to sound. Yep. So auditory deprivation, a lack of access to sound, we don't want it. Um, and like Dr. Tuba said earlier, if you are a family choosing um, a visual language for your mode of communication, then there are other things that we can talk about in terms of language deprivation. Yeah. But today, that was our topic. Uh, we want we want sounds. We want sounds. <laughs> Absolutely. OK, thank you so much for joining us today. And we will see you in the next video. Bye.